Right, good morning everyone. Uh, I want to present today just a very small, tiny part of the recent PhD research which I finished last year, which was looking at um, using narrative theory to understand how we communicate uh, about the Mesolithic period in Britain to public audiences. And I looked across a range of different textual and visual uh, media, uh, one of which of course was museum displays. So this is just a very, very tiny part of the research that I did. And one of the key aspects of things that I did was to look at, as I say, narrative theory. And if you look at um, Seymour Chapman, one of the founders of narratology in the 1970s, he defines narrative as characters performing actions in particular settings subject to disruption by external happenings. More recently, David Herman, one of the key people in narrative theory currently, defines a narrative as a structured time course of particularised events. And he juxtaposes narrative against explanation and description. Explanation which provides general covering ideas about what happened over a, over a general um, scale, and description which just looks at the properties of particular things at a point in time rather than a structured time series and time course. Now, for the Mesolithic, we have an immediate problem in looking at time and how it's portrayed. The Mesolithic is a period which lasts for more than five and a half thousand years in Britain, uh, equivalent to the whole of the most of the Neolithic up to the present day. Now, that's a very, very long period of time. And yet, the way the Mesolithic tends to be written about and be portrayed is very much as a time when people, usually men, hunted animals in woodland with the only real change that you can see is that the shapes of the microliths that they made for their arrowheads changed at some point in the middle. Uh, there isn't really much in terms of a temporal sequence that is usually portrayed. The Mesolithic is usually seen as an ahistorical period in which the beginning and the end were really just, just the same. It's boys with arrows hunting animals. You know? um, what Nairi Finney called the boys and arrows narrative. This barely qualifies at all. And yet, in more recent times, over the last 10 to 15 years, we've been developing more and more finds about the Mesolithic period. We've been refining our knowledge of that period. We've been coming up with much better radiocarbon chronology for the period. And we now do have the possibility of constructing a Mesolithic timeline in which things happened in a sequence, in which early, middle and later parts are exhibiting different kinds of behaviour, and within which there are particular events or happenings in, in Chapman's term, such as the historic tsunami which hit the northeast coast of Britain. And the Mesolithic is therefore, you might think, ripe for temporal narrative to be created. So I'm going to look very quickly at two particular museums that I visited out of the 14 that I looked at, which displayed the Mesolithic in some way. And I'm going to juxtapose one from the UK and one from Denmark. And I emphasise they're both museums that I enjoyed hugely and that I like, but they're very, very different and have a very different approach to how, how time is portrayed. So I want to begin with Cheddar Gorge Prehistory Museum. Uh, museum that some of you in the audience may well know and have been involved in. Uh, the Cheddar Gorge Museum Prehistory display is opposite Goff's Cave, in which uh, there are two sets of key finds. One was a set of finds of Upper Paleolithic human remains with uh, evidence, sometimes disputed, sometimes not, for the possibility of cannibalistic behaviour going on, and a single Mesolithic inhumation burial of a young male in the cave. Two events, something like four and a half thousand years apart. The upper Paleolithic cannibalism dated to around 14,750 BP. The Mesolithic Goss Cave young man burial dated to 10,250 BP. What we encounter when we enter the museum is a disjointed disjuncture of time, a jump in time. You're presented with the modern world and the ancient world with nothing in between. We have the diorama of the excavation of the, of the burial 
and the actual burial behind that, so you jump from, in this case, the 19th century, back into the Upper Paleolithic. This presentation of present and ancient together uh, occurs as you progress through into the museum and you see the Goss Cave young man. Uh, using the Pepper's Ghost technology, you see the skeleton, or a, a facsimile of the skeleton, the real skeleton isn't there, uh, and you see the Goss Cave man as he presumably was when alive. So, so far so good, we have elements of time in the display, uh, but then what we find as we go around the museum, we come into something I like a lot and very much, but the time disappears. And we enter a world in which there is more of a, an exploration of ways of life and technology for hunter-gatherer peoples. And if we carry on through the museum, uh, you come round, around uh, the next corner from this beautiful display of, of replica um, woodwork, leatherwork, stonework and so on, there's a section where children can start to make their own cave paintings. So we get into cave paintings suddenly. We've gone from, from Goss, Goss, Goss Cave, Mesolithic Man, to hunter-gatherer technology, and we're now into southern French cave painting. You then carry on and you come into a part where you talk about hominid evolution. We come to a section on flint napping and technology. We come on to cave finds of all periods from elsewhere around the world. We come on to hunting as a way of life. We come to sexuality and sex in prehistory. We come on to religion and religious behaviour, religious beliefs in hunter-gatherer societies. Then we come on to cannibalism, and we end up with those existential questions about life which that, which that engenders. You go through quite a whirlwind of different things through this museum, which in some ways I find a little bit disjointed, and they're certainly not presented within a sort of temporal narrative. Outside the museum is a bit I love, um, an external activity, experimental area, where school children go and do things. They can uh, go and uh, do <coughs> things in the Upper Paleolithic Mammoth um, Tusk House. Uh, they can do things at the Mesolithic Lakeside, planted with genuine Mesolithic style plant species and so on. And a good place for activity based learning. But again, the Mesolithic and Paleolithic are juxtaposed and for most people going, there's no, cl no clear delineation between them. And this is, is something about the, the museum, where the way it is portrayed, the way it is advertised, it's Cheddar Man and the Cannibals. You come out thinking it's all one and the same thing. You come out not understanding that it's portraying two rather different ways of hunter-gatherer life four and a half thousand years apart. There is no temporal narrative at the museum. Attempts to convey that temporality are occasional. For example, one text panel in the middle of the museum, which is very easy just to walk past as you're distracted by the wonderful cave paintings and sex in prehistory. Right? Uh, there's nothing wrong with sex in prehistory. It's absolutely fine. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, sex in modern times? Well, you know. uh, so what we have at, at the at the Cheddar Museum basically is then I think more a case of something where we have in Herman's terms a description, not a narrative. And there's nothing particularly wrong with that. Although that's a good museum and I enjoyed it hugely, it's a description devoid of a sense of the flow of time and the narrative of time. Now, I want to contrast that with Wedbeck Fundener. My apologies to any Danes in the audience for my mispronunciation of this. Uh, when I was in Denmark and speaking to Danes about this, I was pronouncing it the way my, my phrase book said I should pronounce it. And they were looking at me going, what? Well, uh, and I realised they pronounce it a completely different way. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm still saying, as the phrase book tells me, Vedbeck Fundener, a, a museum devoted to Mesolithic sites uh, in one particular area north of Copenhagen in Denmark. And at this museum, uh, it was built purposely just to go to, to take you around these particular excavated sites. So it's very focused on the Mesolithic. And as you enter the museum, you begin on a temporal journey. You go for it through the displays where you start off in the woodland. And the way that the displays are put together give you this sense of 
shade and darkness with twisty turns and alcoves and you feel as though you are in a woodland. It's that very much that sense. So it's in a sensory term, it's very, very good. Now, uh, to quote from the guidebook, it says, the principal part of the <coughs> exhibition follows a path 7,000 years back in time. As the seasons of the year change, we wander through the territory of the hunters, experiencing their everyday surroundings with our eyes and ears. We get to know how they used nature's resources and what their daily life was like. So it's very much going through from autumn through to winter, through spring to summer. And it's at the scale of human temporality. The colours of the display change depending on the season of the year you're in, the activities change, and it's peppered throughout with instances of human action which are left or suggested. So the humans are not present, they're sort of off stage, and they're impacting on the display. So you see events through the seasonal year in time. So you are humans placed within the temporal sequence. At the end, you arrive at the seaside settlement, the shoreline settlement of Vedbeck, with the panoramic view around you of the sea and the <coughs> coast. And the settlement itself is presented as a moment in time. You have arrived through the woodland at the settlement and the people have just left. And everything is there left behind as it was. And you get the feeling they could come back at any moment into this point in time, as well as into this place. And that's one of the key things. As well as leaving this, this sort of generality, this materiality, this, this culture of artifacts, we also have the people themselves. Among the finds at Bedbeck were some burials, Mesolithic burials. Um, this is one of the famous ones, the bed bed girl, <coughs> 18 or 19 years old, buried with, by her head, a boar tooth, um, possibly necklace or head ornament of some kind, and to one side of her, a newborn young baby. Girl died in childbirth, both buried together, very poignant, very representative of a very moving, very human event in time and is almost the culmination of your experience of this. You go through the woodland, you go through the actions of people in time through this woodland, through the seasons of the year, and it culminates in this human tragedy. It's a very affecting type of museum and very, very worthwhile going to. So then my conclusion there is that with the Vedbeck Fund in a museum, which you see here with the plan, uh, you are actually going on a narrative journey. The narrative is being presented as a structured time course of particularised events. It's in Herman's term a, a, a very strong narrative. The focus is on people and time in a particular place. <coughs> a small place where you feel surrounded and therefore within the woodland and you get to come away with a feeling of what not just Mesolithic life was like but what Mesolithic people might have experienced and some sense of the temporal flow of the year and the temporal flow of human life in the Mesolithic. And I think as much as I enjoyed uh, Cheddar Gorge Museum, and I really did enjoy it, and for schools I think it's an amazing resource, for me Vedbeck wins hands down because of that sense of temporality which gives a structure and gives a humanity to the displays. That's all I say. Thank you very much.